So without any further ado, here is Lorraine Rinelli's conversation with Sue Rocco. I'd like to thank Derek and Ford as well, and of course, Manufacturers Golf and Country Club, and all of you for being here tonight. Just a couple of quick words uh, in addition about Sue. Uh, in case you're not familiar, which I'm sure everybody here is, Women to Watch is heard Sundays at 7 o'clock on 1210 WPHT. It's the premier global media platform for female leaders. Initially, it was created as a weekly radio show, but Women to Watch has developed into digital print, social media, event, and video programs okay, wait for it, that tell the real story behind the titles of some of the most accomplished women of our time. So, of course, as Derek said, we're here tonight to recognize the woman behind women, women to Watch and to get a behind-the-scenes look at the program to learn the real story beside, behind Sue's title of founder and host. And uh, I think we'll be inspired in our brief time together tonight. So I'm going to ask Sue a few questions. And then we'll save a little bit of time for questions from you guys as well, okay? A um, couple of other quick things. Sue's been named among Philadelphia Business Journal's Women on the Move, one of the most inspirational women by EBW 2020, which is empowering a billion women, EBW. She's been featured in HuffPost Business, Philadelphia Life Magazine, and Real Women, and Sue is a board member of London's prestigious Global Thinkers Forum. So quite an accomplishment in quite a short amount of time, from what I understand. So Women to Watch is enjoying its seventh year on air, and momentum keeps building. Tell us how the concept came to be. First, I have to shake off some nerves, because this is very unusual for me to be answering questions. <laughs> I much prefer to be in Lorraine's seat. Um, but I'll, I'll say that the, the concept came first from a fluke morning of me sitting at home and turning the dial on the radio and hearing a woman say, are you a small business owner in the Philadelphia area? And if so, would you like to come on uh, our show and promote your business? And at the time, I was in probably my 20th job um, while searching for the, the job that I do today and that I really love. Um, and I was working for a high-end apparel company out of New York called the Worth Collection. And so I heard that, you know, that uh, note on the air and I thought, I'm going to do that, you know. I, I, I can certainly go on the radio and talk about direct sales and fashion and, and my business. And so I did that and when I went home that day, I thought that is the coolest thing I've ever done, but I want to be on the other side of the microphone. So I sent her a brief, a brief thank you note, and I said, Kim, you know, I graduated in communications a million years ago, so not that I had any experience, but if you ever need someone to fill in for you, I'd love to do it. And she said, um, Sue, I think you have the ability to host a show. Would you like to, to pitch an idea to our general manager? So you, that was the beginning. So you came up with the idea after you got bit by the bug? Pretty much, yes, and, and, yes. But didn't you say, um, we talked um, earlier, that you always wanted to do something like that? I did. I, I have always had um, a passion for people, and I'm just fascinated with people and where they come from and their own stories. And I did go off to Villanova with a, a, a big dream to be in media, um, dreamt of a talk show, but I never... Um, you know, had the guts to pursue that in my 20s and 30s. So it really was at the age of 48 that I decided it was time, you know, to, to believe in myself. 50 is the new 25, that's all I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> don't, I'm not kidding. Um, so when you thought about it after it was suggested that you do your own show, how did you come up with Women to Watch? Was that the initial concept, or did that evolve after something else? Well, the title, I have to give credit to my husband for that. I remember, um, I knew I wanted a show for women. Okay. And I really, I wanted the show to be inspirational and a conversation that would help the listeners um, really be more than inspired, but take action in their own lives. And my belief is that when a woman who has achieved a certain level of success really opens up in a vulnerable way and talks about who she is and how she managed to get to that place, 
um, through her own challenges, which we all have, that is what will move someone beyond inspiration and into action because they'll see something of themselves in that woman. And so when the general manager said, okay, I like the idea of an interview one-on-one, and I said, I want it to be intimate. I want it to be um, truthful. Um, I went home that day and I was flipping through Philadelphia Magazine and I read a story about Sharon Pinkinson who had uh, started out uh, as a um, prop stylist. And then she was um, chosen by Ed Rendell to become the head of the Philadelphia Film Office. And I thought, that's a great story. I gotta find out how she got to do that. And so um, I called up and I said, hi, I'm Sue Rocco and I have a radio show and I'd love to interview Sharon. This was before you this actually This was before had I had anything. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so gracious. She said, sure, come on in and tell me all about it. And I went in and had a meeting that day and she said, well, it sounds good. It sounds really good. Um, you know, I'd be happy to do it. What's the name of the show? And I said, I have no idea, but if you, if you agree to do it, I'll come up with something good. And so I was driving home that day, and I called Chip, and I said, oh my god, Sharon Pinkinson said she'll be on the show, the show that doesn't exist yet, and um, i got to come up with a name. And so Chip and I were talking about different names, and he said, women to watch, and I said, well, you know, it's radio. It's okay. People will, will be listening, and we thought, that's perfect. Absolutely, and radio is theater of the mind, right? And that's right. So, you know, two double meaning there with women to watch because we're watching them grow. So that's right. you did the first show and then realized you got to get another interviewee. Right. What was the criteria and how did you go about finding others? Um, so that was almost seven years ago. Um, basically, I just you know uh, I am born and raised in Philadelphia, so I have a lot of really good friends and family. And um, so I called people up and I said, hey, I have a radio show, you gotta come on my show. And that kind of you know, kept me going for a couple of weeks. Um, I'd love to t tell the story of how naive I was because I really thought that when I brought this idea uh, to the station, they would pay me for the show. And I soon found out that I needed advertisers and sponsors um, <laughs> to sustain a radio show. So then I called some friends and said, you know, you have to advertise on my show. <laughs> I don't have any listeners. No one knows who I am, but, you know, um, and that was the beginning. And I just, you know what, in 2012, I feel that was a very pivotal moment in women being recognized mm -hmm. for their work and their leadership and their um, ability to make a difference. And so the guests just continued to come. It was never hard to find women to tell their stories. At what point did it change from you selecting guests to you fielding uh, requests to be on your show? Um, that you probably a, a couple of years, a couple of years. I was really working very hard to sustain the show financially. Mm -hmm. And so that was um, kind of a juggling act of booking guests, um, finding some advertisers, and uh, building a website social media, all of that. And so it took a little while before people were familiar. Um, and fortunately, um, I do now have publicists that reach out daily um, that have clients that, that are interested in being on the show. So you get to vet them and, and kind of decide. Yes, and that's what, there's so, so many. The show is booked through November right yes. now. And, you know, really what I look for is I always do a pre-interview call, and I make sure that the woman um, who I'm speaking to is willing to really tell her true life story. And I love to kind of connect the dots between the little girl and the leader that she is today. That's what I'm looking to do. So I want them to be open to not just talking about their awards and accolades, but You've, inter you've interviewed people from around the world. What, um, what attributes particularly are you looking for? I'm sure there's many, but if you could name three. Is there three a level attributes of that in, in the interviewee that, you're, that somebody must have to get onto your show? Is um, there a success level? Is there, um, you know? Well, I do, I do look for women who are um, in positions of leadership okay. because I think it's important that um, I'm showing that a woman who is a CEO or a founder or um, an entrepreneur 
how she got to that place. So there's a phrase we use a lot with young girls, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And I'm trying to show young women, and of course, women my age and older, who are still kind of looking, um, that the women who have reached these levels are not better, smarter, different. They have simply um, been able to continue to move forward in spite of the adversity. So that's really important to me that I want, you know, if you're leading in your family or you're leading in your uh, community or your company or if you're on the global stage, everyone is equally important. And so, but it's a matter of really, you know, finding your voice and, and speaking up about what you believe in. Do you have a particular um, subject or woman who, when I say subject, I mean person that you've interviewed that really stands out among the rest? I know that's kind of putting you on the spot because you love them all. And there's a couple here, <laughs> there's a couple women here that have shared their stories. I'm always so incredibly impressed um, with women who have been through, you know, severe uh, tragedies. And, you know, they share stories that, um, to me, are so incredibly hard to hear. And yet they still get out of bed and move forward. And, and just about every woman I've interviewed, and there's been hundreds, they really don't talk about um, barriers and, you know, historical things that have held them back. They just do what they're good at. They believe they can do it. Um, and they prove themselves. And so I've had a lot of interviews like that, that um, really impressive. Have you ever had an interview that you expected to go in one direction and then it completely does a 180 on you? Yes. <laughs> can, can you give us an example of how you handled that? Um, I'm pretty good with, you know, just going with the flow. Switching gears and pivoting, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I think it, the hardest interviews are um, when I, you know, ask a question and perhaps my guest is nervous and they just say yes. <laughs> no. Right, right. Yes. Right. And I need them to elaborate, you know, to have a good banter back and forth. Um, You've interviewed, um, just if I was going to do the math and this isn't my forte, um, <laughs> in, in a group with a lot of numbers people. You've had to have interviewed over well over 300 people over seven years, right? Yes. Um, yes. All women or any men? I have interviewed some men. Yes. Um, and I love that. So, How did that work out? Um, great, because men like Derek Bowles, who are advocates for women's leadership, um, are awesome. And I always love having a man's view on why it matters that we have women in politics and medicine and science and you know, what our gifts are that are different from men, that when you bring those two equally to the table, make a huge difference. So um, one gentleman in particular uh, was the head of compliance for Thomson Reuters. His name was David Curran. And he has three daughters. And he just, he reached out to me. He found my show, I guess via LinkedIn or something. And he said, I really, you know, I want to talk about what you're doing. Uh, and I want to talk about why it matters. And um, I've had three, four, four men have been on the show, and all with great, great stories and reasons for why they care. How does the audience react to that, to having some men on the show? Have you got any feedback? Yes, I think they want more, okay. and, and I would love to do that. I mean, I, think I focus on women because um, we have enough men in leadership. <laughs> We're looking for women in leadership, but to have the conversation, I think it's really important um, for men to speak up and say, we understand um, what's happening now in the world and, and why you know we're looking to support women. Uh, people will ask me why. Why do you have a show and you only interview women? And I and I think for me personally, um, I've always been interested in peace, and I think that women are natural born <laughs> peacemakers, and. Um, I think that when women who bring this collaborative um, desire to, to solve problems, which I think we do that naturally, that we're going to see great change in the world. And this is just a little you know, seed to plant to do that. So you said that when you interview women, you like to, get, you like to make the, connect the dots between their childhood and their role as a great leader today. Um, 
help us connect the dots with you. Where's the connection to that, that led you? I mean, we know now how the show started and your career path, but what was it in you that made you want to embark on a public platform like this? Have you shared your story? Do you uh, care to do that tonight? A little bit. I will. Okay. I will. Um, Margaret's here. She knows my story very well. Um, I think um, one of the biggest personal things that I'll share with everyone is that when I was young, I um, struggled greatly with um, severe anxiety, very low self-esteem, a lack of belief in myself, and um, for many reasons. Um, what I did very well is something we talk about on the show often is um, imposter syndrome, and this is when uh, women go out with a big smile and present themselves as if everything's okay. And I was able to do that for a long, long time. Um, and I was always searching, uh, feeling that I wanted to make the world a better place, but I didn't know how to do that. <clears throat> and so I worked very hard on myself for a long, long time. Um, and I didn't share with anyone that I was struggling inside. I'm gonna try not to cry. <clears throat> and, um, one of, the, one of the biggest mistakes I think we can make, men, women, children, anyone, is that when you're struggling, if you keep that secret, um, it doesn't help you, right? So I, tr you know, I really was um, just working on myself. And then I met my husband and I had my children and um, I was trying job and job. I went from job to job to job and nothing felt right to me. Um, and I had one of those incredible aha moments. It was a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. on August 7th in 2012. And the word original came to me in a very, very powerful way. Um, I had spent a lot of time uh, looking around at what everyone else was doing and comparing myself and thinking that I wasn't smart. Um, and when I thought Every human being on the planet is an original, a one of a kind. That is incredible. And it woke me up because I thought if that is true and we know it to be true, then everyone has something completely different to offer the world than anyone else. And I decided that day to go out into the world as Sue Rocco and be my full self and not worry about what others thought or what others believed. And that was the beginning of my confidence and and letting go of the anxiety really i mean it changed my life that day you seem pretty confident right now you feel better i do <laughs> <laughs> that was so hard <laughs> i got it We're going to take questions um, from the audience in a minute, but I just want to ask you uh, one more. What are your aspirations for the future of Women to Watch mm, so and like for Sue Rocco? Yeah, well, for the show, um, uh, Mr. Joe Krause is out here, and um, I want to just give a quick mention about him because he's another man who supports me so, so much and has been so great and really was um, the catalyst for bringing my show to 1210 CBS. And we have big dreams, so I really want the show to be national, and I would love to have a watch team in every city. So I have this wonderful team of women who are contributors on the show, and they bring their expertise in health and business and science and technology and leadership. And they're a part of the show, and I really, um, you know, my goal is to, to uh, expand and have these women be uh, experts and leaders in, in every city, and, and we're gonna do it. Right, Joe? Okay, don't judge by the vowel at the end of the name, but I'm gonna take odds at the end on the number of weeks or months until this happens, and we hear Sue in every city out of the radio station and everything. I'm kidding, I'm not really taking bets. So it's just, you know, I, I, think it would be, I think it's gonna happen sooner rather than later because we're already interviewing people from all over the country and all over the world, which is really remarkable. Uh, Sue's um, podcasts and, and previous shows can all be heard on your website. 
Yes, women to women to watch dot net. Dot yes, for, for anyone who doesn't know, it's women the number two watch dot net N E T. And I failed to say that if you are taking pictures, if you're posting, if you've checked in at Manufacturers Country Club, please make sure you do the hashtag women number two watch women to watch. So we have about ten minutes for questions. Who has the first question for Sue? Did I see a hand over here? No. <laughs> right here. There you go. Two questions, go ahead. Really quick, um, do you do anything with girls' schools or girls? And that's number one. And then number two, do you have any interviewers that you sort of uh, particularly respect and perhaps you know, model yourself a little bit after? So let me just repeat the question for those who may not have heard it. Um, the question was, does Sue do anything for girls and girls' schools or girls in school? And is there an interview, uh, E, who you modeled yourself after? An interview. Oh, an interviewer. Okay. Um, I do have. I do a lot for girls. We have a girls to watch blog on our website, and I have these two incredible young women. Uh, one is from India, and one is from Jordan, and they bring remarkable stories of young girls doing great work from around the world, starting companies, founding organizations. Um, really, really great stories. Um, I also am a board member of the Global Thinkers Forum and I'm a mentor, so I am connected to young girls um, every year, a new young lady um, who's looking for advice, inspiration, you know, around her own endeavors. And so um, I, I do that as well. Um, I think it's really important to, you know, get to girls as young as we can. I don't, I always say, I've said this to my own daughter, I don't want you to wait till you're in your 40s and 50s to believe in yourself. Let's do it now, you know. Um, as far as modeling, I, I think I really am trying to just be myself in everything that I do. So I don't want to or try to model myself uh, after another interview. I think, you know, the best we can always do um, is be our original self. And what is your name that asked the question? I'm sorry. Uh, Pia. Pia? Um, thank you, and feel free to take that beautiful centerpiece home for asking the question. <laughs> I was told to do that. It's, it, it's yours. It's legit. You can have it. Now, who has the next question? <laughs> I, I think what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. And um, like I say to everybody, you are as genuine when you are interviewing, when the cameras are rolling and when the cameras are off. You are who you are. And I think that is just a huge thing that you bring out sunshine wherever you go. And the other thing is, so who would you like to interview? Like, what is your one goal oh, and so why? Um, does anyone in here know Brene Brown? Yeah. We love her. We love her. <laughs> really, really, she's at the top of my bucket list. Malala? Oh my gosh. Who's braver than Malala? Personally? <laughs> I, I shook her hand for all of 30 seconds out of Well, settle down to ask the letter. question, and <laughs> it counts for me. Take it home. <laughs> Jill, feel free to steal a uh, glass. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm being so stereotypical. <laughs> really, you know, Brene Brown, Malala, um, this might sound so obvious, but Oprah Winfrey, to me, the reason she's Oprah Winfrey is because she, I believe, was one of the first to be vulnerable on, you know, on television. And she asked the best question I think I ever heard. Um, I can't remember the interview, but she asked somebody, you know, there's very few truths in the world. What do you know for sure? I thought that is such a great question. So although we all know her life story, I feel like I could get something out of her maybe. But <laughs> we don't know. Let me dig it out. Go ahead. So I have a few comments for you, Lorraine, and then a question for you. Okay. So Lorraine, I have your book, Gravy Wars. <laughs> I did not ask her. <laughs> empowered women who were in the kitchen cooking together and just being 
um, encouraging other people to be homemakers, which I loved. Oh, great. Um, that's I've never heard that kind of compliment. Yes. Um, so that's for you. And then um, I have a question for you, Susan. If you could go back before your aha moment and talk to your younger self about your anxiety and your switching jobs and not feeling any like you didn't know where you were going, what advice would you give that person? Did everybody hear that? Okay. So one of the things that um, <clears throat> I believe is doesn't always work um, is telling a, telling other people how to believe in themselves. You know, we all hear that over and over. Believe in yourself. You're special. You're here for a reason. You have a calling. And I think in order for any one of us to get to that place, you have to get there on your own. Um, to have it sustain. So I like to try to um, ask young girls questions about themselves um, to help them find <coughs> where they're meant to be rather than you know giving advice. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the best questions I think to do that for anyone to do it for ourselves is what are you doing when you're feeling the most joyful? So aside from family and friends and you know all the things that make us happy, what are you doing when you're feeling joyful? What are you doing creatively? And I think that that's a great question that leads people to what they're supposed to be doing. So for me, it's talking to people. I just love talking to people and hearing their story, you know. And I was able to turn that into a business, you know. Um, and I think that's true for anyone. Um, so I would have asked my, my, my little self, you know, what, what, do you, what brings you joy? And it was always meeting people and, and talking to them and finding out where they came from. Excellent. And you get a centerpiece. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Among, among the many voices uh, speaking for women today, apart from Oprah, who you've mentioned, um, who do you think um, is uh, becoming more effective, and, and who do you do you look to and, and encourage, or would hope that they become more uh, influential? Uh -huh. uh, a public figure? Public figures, yes. Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, I, I wonder if you would start anyone, with or anyone. I mean, is there anyone that you're, well, because you know, there aren't many voices out there. Who do you think is more effective and why? I think Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But I wonder, is there any one person, Sue, that you think that could speak for all women? Or is there somebody that can be neutral enough to, to speak, you know, uh, publicly, <coughs> and maybe even with a bigger mic? Or, you know, maybe, you know, in a couple of weeks or months, that is Sue. Well, you know, it's, a, it's a great, when I think about all of the women that I interviewed, have interviewed, some are very high profile and everyone knows who they are. Mm -hmm. Others are not. And they tend to have the best stories. And, and, and I'm always so much more impressed by them because they are not looking for adulation or fame or, or they're just head down doing their job and doing their work. And those women, uh, they're, there's many, you know, I can't think of a name off the top of my head, but um, there, was a, there was a woman who, um, she came on my show and about five minutes before we were gonna go on the air, she said, <clears throat> Sue, I'm going to share for the very first time publicly um, something very, very personal. Mm -hmm. And wow, you know, I, I said, okay, let's do it. And um, she has a leadership firm. She goes into Fortune 500 companies and she fires up their employees. And um, you know, she's a, a leadership coach. And um, she was struggling her entire life with clinical depression. And she worked with some very high profile people. And so she didn't want anyone to know because she thought it would affect her career. Mm. And that particular interview, she had a man on the air with her. 
because this gentleman, who was an executive at Tiffany and Company, hired her and believed in her and knew her backstory and it didn't matter to him and he encouraged her to talk about it openly. And um, her name is Michelle Tenzik and she's an extraordinary woman um, and she should probably be heard by more people How about that? for her resilience. Especially given the subject and in the same yes. age where it is more acceptable and understood. Yes. I think we have time for one more question. Do we have one over here? We have one way back there, go ahead. Back, um, in the back over here. Janine Greenwood. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, I just called this, this young woman oh, here. We'll, we'll get both of you. Go ahead. I was going to ask, is there a common theme that you've seen over the 300 interviews among answers or themes in your interviews? Um, you know, it depends on the industry. I see a lot of themes within industries. So I've interviewed a lot of attorneys. And... There's some female attorneys in here, but they'll understand. The legal profession seems to be in the dark ages. They're really, you know, they're they're kind of slow to um, supporting women. And um, oh, Angie, maybe I could ask Angie. Uh, <laughs> that, and my brother's an attorney. When I f started to hear this theme over and over about um, men not, you know, giving the right opportunities to women that are coming up in the ranks in the legal profession. You know, I said to my brother, Mark, what the, what's going on here? Why, why are women not, you know, giving, being given this opportunity? And that's a theme across the board um, in the legal profession. Technology is so, so cool. So I interview women that are, you know, coding and developing software programs and all this kind of stuff, and, and they, they, they are so passionate about um, designing and creating things. They have no interest in uh, being in the public eye or, or being well known. That's a theme I see um, across the board for women in technology. So there's, there's themes in different industries, I guess. But I think I mentioned before, one of the things that I have found so um, common throughout the leadership is that they don't pay attention to naysayers or barriers or perhaps men that don't see their abilities. Um, and I think that's great, great advice. All right, let's take your question and then. Okay. Um, Sue, how do you feel that the women, um, the Me Too movement has impacted maybe your audience or your the people that you've interviewed? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, how they've impacted. So the Me Too movement, which is, an, there's awful stories around the Me Too movement, but as I do with it, I, I see positive um, change has come out of that because historically what has happened, and I think we all acknowledge, you know, um, bad things that happen between men and women in certain situations, men that are not gentlemen, perhaps. And um, that now, with this, you know, big awakening, um, that women can say, I don't have to do that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Don't speak to me that way. That's not appropriate. Um, so I think it's the beginning of, of great change. And, you know, it's like anything, you know, once you start to talk about something, that is when the change comes. So now it's like the cat's out of the bag. You know, there's been a lot of inappropriate um, behavior, and now women have the power, because it's out there and open, to say no. All right, we're going to wrap up with um, some rapid-fire questions for Sue. I just want to remind you, hashtag women to watch. And as far as the rest of the um, centerpieces, they're all for grabs. So we're thinking... Um, you know, arm wrestle, or, I don't know. Suzanne Berger gets one for driving the furthest. There you go, whoever came the furthest. Okay, so we have, we have just a few quick rapid fire questions for Sue. We're gonna try to wrap it up on a, on a fun note. Um, just some curiosity, uh, Sue, favorite author? Brene Brown. Okay, favorite TV show? All that time. 
<laughs> I've never seen it. I love the Goldbergs. All right, let's get to the next one. Favorite singer or group you have? Oh, Alicia Keys. Okay. Uh, describe the perfect Saturday. Um, I'm with my kids. The Aww. sun is shining, and there's a big game on TV. Excellent. Probably the Eagles. You're a football fan. Yeah, sure. Oh, Absolutely. great, great. Uh, top three bucket list items. Now we know one is to interview Oprah. Yeah. Other two. To go national. Okay. Make the show. Six weeks. <laughs> That's the smart money. Lorraine. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Third. No. A third. Uh, um. Uh, I want to go to Africa. Cool. But Chip doesn't want to go. <laughs> But I think Chris really want to go. <laughs> All right, if you could interview anybody from history, who would it be? It's cutting in and out. Anne Frank. Oh, very wow. cool. Very cool. All right, the biggest question of all of all of your Italian relatives, which is the best cook? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with Cindy because she's not here. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, actually, these are my. These are my. Three Italian. Three of your sisters. I have five, and they, they, they make me look so bad with the cooking. <laughs> They're all great cooks. I had to ask for a cooking question. Um, we're going to bring Derek back. Is that what I'm? Okay. I just really quickly want to say thank you to Ford as well. Thank you, Sue Rocco, for thank a funny. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. Um, Sue will hang out for pictures. Remember, hashtag women to watch. And you can go right in front of the step and repeat and take pictures there. I want to thank Joe Krause and Jacob Media, Manufacturers Golf and Country Club. And um, if, again, go to womentowatch.net to see past shows. And make sure you listen to Sue Sundays on 1210 WPHT at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorraine.